On July 29, 1966, Nigeria's bloodiest coup happened. This coup, also called the July Rematch or the Northern Counter Coup, would claim the life of Nigeria's first military head of state, Major General Johnson Thomas Aguirunsi. Many officers and soldiers of Igbo extraction would also lose their lives. Those who escaped lost their positions. In this inside story of Nigeria's bloodiest coup, we shall take a look at how the coup happened, why it failed in Enugu, and of course, the emergence of Yakubu Gowon as Nigeria's second military head of state. By mid-1966, Nigeria's first military coup on January 15, 1966, had been largely considered a plot born out of tribal sentiment and particularly initiated by the Igbos. Both the foreign and local media at the time were said to have foiled this notion with repeated broadcast, analyzing why the January coup was an Igbo coup. For about three weeks, Radio Kaduna broadcasted speeches of the murdered Amadu Belu and Tafawa Baliwa. This was believed to have stirred up tribal sentiments and negative feelings against the South. Even though the coup failed, lives had been lost, most of which were the Northerners. And to add salt to the injury, the coup plotters had neither been tried nor executed. There were also rumors that they were still being paid while in prison. The rage from the North was loud and clear, but the ruling head of state, General Agui Ronsi, was reluctant to put the conspirators on trial. The Northerners fear that all of the preceding events were part of a grand plot to give the Igbos dominance of the country. When promotions were to take place within the army, 25 officers were promoted, of which 19 of them were Igbos and Midwesterners, five from the north and one from the southwest. Even though the promotions were found to be well-deserved by the officers in question, there were already preconceived notions of favoritism that would not be easily abated. To cap it all, there were accusations that Ironsi gave special preference to Southerners when assigning positions in his cabinet. The tipping point had been Ironsi's decision to do away with regionalization and to operate a unitary system of government. Ironsi believed the Unification Decree No. 34 would help restore peace and unity to Nigeria. The general had been advised against it earlier by several northern officials, but he ignored their advice. This further confirmed the suspicions of the northerners and on May 24, 1966, Aguiyi Ironsi passed the decree. Just like what the Westerners had earlier done that earned the region the name, the Wild West, the Northerners also decided to take laws into their own hands. As a result of the delayed trial of the coup plotters, which many Northerners considered lenient and inappropriate, they went on a rampage, killing thousands of Igbos and other Southerners living in the North. The coup had been perceived to be an Igbo coup. The killings went on for months, starting from around May 1966 and slowed down to a halt in September of the same year. Thousands of Igbos ranging from 8,000 to 30,000 were said to have been killed during this pogrom. The genocide reached its peak on September 29, 1966, which has been referred to as a Black Thursday. About a million Igbos fled back to the east to escape the massacre. There were also retaliations in eastern cities, particularly Port Harcourt, where the Northerners were also murdered. This also led to a large number of Northerners fleeing the eastern region for safety. Nigeria was barely six years old into independence and seemed to be falling apart already. During this chaos and six months after the first coup, a group of northern officers decided to oust the sitting government. This coup, popularly referred to as the July rematch, would be bloodier than the first and would claim the lives of almost 10 times the initial number of lives claimed in the January coup. 
The code name for this counter coup was Araba, a Hausa coinage that was interpreted as let us separate. The coup plotters wanted to secede, causing the northern region to stand on its own. Led by Lieutenant Colonel Murtala Mohammed, the inspector of signals, the principal plotters of the coup were about 30 in number. Lieutenant Colonel Adekunle Fajui had been playing host to Major General Aguyi Ronsi when they were both kidnapped from the State House and murdered. The counter coup began on the 9th of July 28, 1966, six months and 13 days after the first coup. Despite various attempts by Iran Sea to pacify the northerners, it seemed they were bent on having their own pound of flesh. The coup was postponed on different occasions due to last-minute changes, but its time came when Iran Sea decided to go on a nationwide tour. The mutineers had been warned not to kill the general on northern soil and so they had to wait. When Ironsi got to Ibadan, while on his tour, he was hosted by the military governor of the western region, Lieutenant Colonel Adekunle Fajuyi. Unfortunately for Ironsi, in a bid to prove that he wasn't showing any form of favoritism to the Igbos, he surrounded himself with northerners. His security guards consisted largely of northerners, two of which were among the principal plotters of the coup. Major Theophilus Yakubu Danjuma and Lieutenant William Walbe. The trigger for the July coup started in Abelkuta. Rumors of an impending coup had got to Lieutenant Colonel Gabriel Okumweze commanding officer of the Abelkuta unit, who made futile attempts to rally his troops. Shortly after, Okunweze, Major John Obienu, commander of the Greece squadron, and Lieutenant Colonel Orok were gunned down. This was the same Obienu who had been originally part of the January coup, but had failed to show up on the D-Day. The officers who led this attack were Sergeant Sabo Kole and Corporal Maisamari Maje. Frantic calls were made to Lagos to salvage the growing mayhem, but turned out to fuel the flame as it alerted coup plotters positioned in other parts of the country. Lieutenant Nuhu Nathan, who had received a call from Lagos, alerted the coup leaders, Lieutenant Colonel Murtala Mohammed and Major Martin Adamu, who gave the go-ahead for the coup to commence in other parts of the country. In Abelkuta, Igbo soldiers were singled out and executed. The same was said to have happened in Lagos, Ibadan, Kaduna, Kano. Ikecha had become the ad hoc headquarters of the coup as the airport had been forcefully taken over by a team of soldiers led by Murtala Mohammed. The coup plotters had had plans to secede from Nigeria and also planned to send their families home to the north using one of the British aeroplanes after the coup was over. By the next morning, a team of soldiers led by Danjuma stormed the government house. Danjima was said to have received a call from Guwon, during which he informed the senior officer of the coup and plans to arrest Ironsi, to which Guwon had responded, Can you do it? And afterwards cautioned him to avoid bloodshed. Many believed Yakubu Guwon had secretly been a part of the July 29, 1966 coup. This was due to his sudden absence from the day the coup started to August 1st, when he was announced as the new head of state. The phone conversation he had with Major Danjuma about Ironsi also fanned the flames of the suspicions of many. Danjuma couldn't have initiated that line of conversation without Gowon having prior knowledge of their plans. Also, Gowon was supposed to have accompanied General Ironsi on his nationwide tour as the Army Chief of Staff. If he wasn't available, the next in command was the General Staff Officer Grade 1, Lieutenant Colonel Amuna, should have accompanied the General. But for some reason, Gowon appointed Major Theophilus Danjuma, a Grade 2 Staff Officer and Deputy to Lieutenant Colonel Mike Ivenso, the Adjutant General of the Army, to accompany the Supreme Commander, eventually leading him into the cold hands of death. Ironsi and Fajuyi were abducted along with their aides de camp. They were beaten and interrogated. The captors questioned Ironsi about his involvement in the January 15, 1966 coup, which the head of state denied. They were eventually dragged to a bush and executed while their aides managed to escape. 
Their bodies were discovered in shallow graves on the outskirts of Ibado days later. It took about six months before they were both officially declared dead by Gowon and given a military burial. The coup, however, did not see the light of day in the east, despite plans to execute it in Enugu. Lieutenant Colonel Emeka Ojuku, the military governor of the eastern region, had also been a target for elimination. Lieutenant Colonel David Ogunewe, commander of the 1st Battalion in Enugu, got wind of the killings happening across the country and acted fast. He locked the battalion's armory and kept it under the care of a mixed tribe of northern and southern soldiers. Some northern soldiers made unsuccessful attempts to break into the armory, but they were hindered. Once again, like the January coup, the July coup failed in the eastern region due to the proactiveness of the commanding officers stationed there. Over the next three days, negotiations were held in Ikeja over the Northerners' call for secession. That had been their only condition for a ceasefire to which Ujuku had responded over a call with Brigadier Baba Femi Oguntikbe, Ironsi's deputy, that if that is what they want, let them go. Eventually, the Northerners' call for secession was negotiated and a coup led to the emergence of Ironsi's chief of army staff, Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowon, on August 1, 1966. We always have more stories like this to talk about, so don't hesitate to like and share this video with your friends. You can subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to receive the latest videos as they drop. Also, if you would like to know more about the rise and fall of Yakubu Gowon, do check out our next video.